If we can go to the next slide. All right, so today's goals, kind of a quick recap of what we're going to be doing today. Uh, we're going to meet our GSLI team and some of our team and just get a little bit, uh, let you know a little bit more about what we are here for and how we operate. We're going to give an overview of the project and let you kind of see what the project is all about. And then we're going to go live and uh, meet the star of the show, Chris, with Project Tex, uh, Technical Textiles and get an in-depth knowledge and go kind of through a Q&A session so that we can find out exactly what his needs are in his project. And then we'll go through our Q&A session. So a lot of people, they always ask, should you be here? We want you to know, you know, the importance of our prospect live events is to get all of the information out on the table so that Chris's project can be successful and communities can sit back and identify if their project meets the needs and really uh, disqualify themselves if they don't feel the project's a good match and qualify themselves if they are a good match. Uh, today, we've got community clients. Uh, those are clients and cities that work it within our network that we know and um, work with on a daily basis. We have some trial communities that are sitting in on this prospect live event, uh, better understanding our process and, and the transparency of our process when we work with projects. And then we have observing companies and site locators. Um, those are companies that we are also talking with that want to learn about this process and see how effective it is. And we have some observing communities. Those could be clients, those could be non-clients, and those are communities that just want to learn and, and listen to what the prospects uh, are looking for and, and help them better themselves and become better, um, better stewards of bringing new business to their communities. If you could, Chris, let's throw up the attendance poll. I always like to know how many prospect live events you've attended. If you're here with us today, and that gives us a good uh, idea of um, people that we're working with in communities. I see we've got communities from all over the country. All right, some housekeeping items. You should already be muted. Um, that's great. We don't want we don't want a lot of back noise when we have so many communities on here. Um, we're, when we go live, um, that's an opportunity for you with the questions. It's an opportunity for you to raise your hand if you have a in depth question, and I'll see that you've raised your hand, and we can open up your mic and let you ask the questions directly. Uh, when we get into our Q and A section. Um, there's a Q and a uh, button down at the bottom. That's the one we want you to click on and start filtering in your questions. And there's kind of a, a process that we go through um, and we'll clear all those questions through this session so that everybody gets their answers. Um, very important, we are recording and transcribing uh, this prospect live event. So uh, if someone isn't able to attend or they want to kind of go back when they're preparing their submission and, and listen uh, to some of the questions and make sure they're putting together a proper submission, they can go back and do that. Who's with us today? Obviously, I'm here. Um, I am the CEO of Global Site Location Industries. We've been doing our, uh, our connections with communities and companies for over 25 years. We've got Brooke Edwards. She's our project director. Uh, she interfaces with the projects and coordinates a lot of the packets of information and uh, make sure that that flow is smooth between the community and the companies. And we've got Chris. He's the CEO of Project Technical Textiles. About GSLI, real quick, uh, we are a site location consulting firm and we work for companies and expand uh, for companies communities and expanding companies. And we are comprised of an exclusive network of communities throughout the United States that we know and trust and work with and help when a uh, company is looking into a particular state. So we make introductions to those um, communities who are our field offices and know exactly what's happening on the ground. We never claim to be an expert. We expect our communities to be experts on their communities and what they can offer these companies. Um, our communities in the network work with us on an unlimited number of projects, and we do allow non-members to come in if there's a right fit with one project 
to uh, submit a proposal and um, we allow that on a 12 month basis. Uh, we want the most possible submissions and good submissions for our particular projects. That, that also gives them an opportunity to learn a little bit more about what we do and how they can work with us. Some stats down at the bottom, you can kind of take a look at those. We've been busy since 1994 and uh, we've been excited. And we had an opportunity yesterday to talk on a radio station in Mississippi um, and really enjoyed that opportunity and went through those statistics and, and how uh, impactful they've been over the past 25 years. Uh, this is our portal. We currently have 84 projects uh, that we're working with and coordinating with. Uh, we've got some announcements that uh, Brooke will kind of tap into uh, last uh, an announcement last week of one of our project live events. And we have another big announcement coming down this week or just just after this week. And, and that's really where we feel we fulfilled our mission when we can make those announcements. And we're excited about those all the time. Um, all projects can be viewed at uh, gsliprojectportal.com and you can kind of scroll through those and take a look and, and see what type of projects that we're working with. Um, really excited about this. Um, I have been working eight months now uh, diligently on the new portal uh, project, uh, project portal. Um, we're less than 30 days away from launch, so I really don't want to get into it in depth right now, but there's some new tools that we've added to the portal. It's going to be a total game changer in terms of the way communities really can start working projects within five minutes of working with us. Uh, if they go in, they'll get project updates. There's some status tags we put on it. They can build their pipeline, and uh, we make it very easy to register for these events and go back to the replays. But Mark your calendars or, or, or look for some emails um, about us promoting that new launch. At this point, I want, uh, this is the opportunity for Brooke um, to talk and, and she kind of will give some insight on how we came across. Now that's important to, to understand is how we engaged and became familiar with this project. And um, Brooke, if you can, let's talk about the project and how you got involved. Thanks, Eric. Um, so like you mentioned, my name's Brooke Edwards, and I'm the project director for GSLI. I essentially help identify projects, communicate the needs and criteria to communities, and I also help manage and organize a lot of the site submissions that come in um, for our projects. So I want to touch briefly on how we identify projects, because that's always a curiosity that comes from communities a few of these methods we utilize are email marketing campaigns, internet research, telemarketing. We do a lot of outreach on LinkedIn and social media. Uh, we also run stories and digital ads in our media publication, which is Global Trade Magazine. And we work with communities that have expanding companies um, as what is called a referral lead. So um, those are a few of the methods that we use. And in the case of this project, we reached out to companies through a few email campaigns and Chris reached out to us after seeing our Choose Texas emails. And so Choose Texas is a state specific marketing program that's focused on educating companies about the benefits of expanding into Texas. So once Chris and I connected and I got to understand his project's needs better, uh, we established a search region, a geographic search for um, from Texas to the Carolinas. So that's how I identified this project. Um, so like Eric mentioned, we did have a big update happen over the past few weeks. And I just wanted to share that briefly on our call here. Um, you guys have might have seen a little bit of information about Project Pipe Machinery. They are a Netherlands based pipe machinings company, and they ended up landing in Tulsa, Oklahoma at the end of February. So we had identified this project at fab tech show that was back in 2019 which seems like so long ago um, so we're really excited that they found a new site for their needs and the ceo expressed his gratitude to me for all the submissions that he received from the community so thank you to everyone that submitted a site um, that was very helpful and useful for him to uh, sift through and help um, identify his site 
I also just wanted to take the time to mention our lead of the week emails. I send out these qualified project leads each week to our non-member communities. And this is really just to help educate communities on our project's needs. So projects can span all regions, all states, all um, specs and land requirements. Um, so some might be more applicable to your region or your area than others, but um, we're just curious, have you been receiving these project leads? So I'm going to put up a quick poll, and if you don't mind answering that, that would be really helpful for us to see um, if you're currently receiving them, and if not, would you like to receive these? Like I said, these are just um, projects that we've qualified. Um, they've run through a series of minimum requirements, and we end up putting them in our portal, so they're ones that communities that especially our members are actively working. So um, thank you guys ahead of time for doing that. Thank you, Brooke. Yeah. So let's talk about the project. Uh, project Technical Textiles, they are on a very active site location search. Uh, some of the things, uh, basics about the thing, they're looking for acreage that's probably gonna be less than 10 acres. Uh, they need 70 to 100,000 square foot of space. We'll dive in a little bit deeper whether or not that's a build a suit or an existing facility. Um, new jobs, they will be creating 60 plus jobs by year three. Um, their investment, uh, capital investment up front is somewhere between close to uh, $5 million. And their time frame is six to nine months. So as you can see, it's a very fast tracked um, site location process we got to go through from uh, uh, finding the right site and um, getting them in operation. So now we're going to go into our Q&A. Uh, we've had questions that have been submitted by uh, several communities that we always kind of go through first. That gives you an opportunity as a, a viewer to sit in and come up with your own questions. And as I said, you'll use your Q&A box. Those will start filtering into our Q&A. Hopefully we'll do an amazing job and answer all those questions. But for any unanswered questions, um, we'll go into those. And please, when you ask your question, make sure you put your name and your location so that we can kind of know where you're, uh, where you're coming from. So with that said, Chris, are you here? I'm here. Awesome. Chris, I want to thank you for the, the time that you've spent with us educating about the project. It's a really exciting project and one that we typically, uh, we work with so many different industries and this is an industry that we're really excited about working with. Um, and uh, so why don't we start off just by, give us a little bit of, tell us about your company, the customers, customers you serve and what are your motivations of this project uh, site selection? Um, well, thank, thank you, Eric, and thanks, Brooke, for putting this together. Um, you, you know, we, we've, we've been successful in navigating the, uh, the COVID situation, and our business is, is quite busy. Uh, and we're at the point where we need to invest in new equipment uh, and expand our capacities. Um, being a Northeast manufacturer, uh, it's, it's not the most conducive area to manufacturing. And, uh, and manufacturing personnel. Uh, so as we're looking at expanding, uh, we're trying to look at maybe our areas that are more conducive to manufacturing, um, as well as trying to locate our operation in closer to where our customer base is. Um, our customer base is uh, centered in and around the Southeast, Southwest, uh, from the Carolinas right around through Texas. Uh, we do a lot of business with the energy sector, the refining uh, industry. So the Gulf is a big area for us. Uh, we also do a lot with automotive uh, suppliers, which are also in the Texas El Paso region, uh, moving product back and forth across into Mexico. So, you know, our, our key motivation is, uh, and obviously cost is always, uh, is always a consideration. The cost of doing business in the Northeast is quite high. So you put those three together, access and availability of uh, production personnel, uh, close to our customer base, and uh, just general lower cost operations, uh, especially in the utility areas, 
uh, are kind of our three major motivational aspects to the project. Perfect. So you, you kind of outlined some of the, the needs there and, and some of the parameters. What would you say are the must-haves in an existing facility? Uh, well, our operation runs 24 hours a day, five days a week, sometimes into six days a week. So, you know, we need to have un uninterrupted supply of uh, electricity and natural gas. Um, we really want to tap into an area where, uh, you know, our personnel kind of fit, uh, not minimum wage, but, you know, in and around the 13 to $15 an hour range. Um, that's getting harder to find in, in our area. Um, Perfect. Uh, are there any specifics on your building? Do you need any clear spans? Do you need um, dock doors, those types of things? Yeah, we need, you know, three to four dock doors, maybe one drive-in door. Um, Height-wise, uh, so we have uh, our equipment is... Uh, we put we apply coatings to different types of fabrics so we either do it in a horizontal fashion or in a vertical fashion our vertical dryers are 30 to 40 feet high uh, so we would need an area of the building that is either 30 to 40 feet high or have the ability to put like retrofit a penthouse which we've done at our current facility in about a 600 square foot section of the of the facility uh, the rest of it can be you know 20 foot high Okay, perfect. So when we were talking yesterday, you kind of you dove into the importance of a port. Um, talk to talk to our listeners about why that's important and and how you use that. So about fifty percent of our raw materials are imported uh, from either Europe, Eastern Europe, or Asia, China, Korea. Um, so proximity to ports important uh, from a cost standpoint and also from uh, you know a just a logistics, ease of logistics standpoint. Uh, we also are exporting more and more of our products to Europe and Asia. Uh, probably 30% of our business is export and that's a growing. So, you know, proximity to a port just from a convenience factor and a cost factor uh, makes, makes sense to us. Perfect. So, a lot of our communities, they, they believe in clustering and putting like companies together to help them be more efficient in their needs. Um, can you speak to any industry or raw suppliers that would help if you were around uh, in your location, your new location? It, it, it's really tough to pinpoint. Uh, our suppliers are all over the place. Uh, we have chemical suppliers from the Midwest, uh, we do have some of our film and, and other suppliers in the south, um, but they're, they're really not concentrated too heavily um, anywhere. If anything, some of our textile suppliers uh, are still in, this, you know, in the southeast region, but again, that's, it, it's become more of an import business. Okay. So work on, we're working with another project that's um, you and I talked about this yesterday, and one of the challenges they, they are faced with is labor, you know, a consistent, reliable, um, and sustainable workforce. And that's been a problem, um, you know, an issue for a lot of communities. And it's gotten a lot better over the last year. But talk to me about the types of employees and what you're looking to hire and what challenges you're facing right now. It, you know, not being in a manufacturing area, we're more of in a service area uh, and distribution area. It's hard to find employees who want to work 40, 50, 60 hours a week. Uh, we work either 10 or 12 hour shifts. Um, so that's that's been a struggle. And as we continue to grow, uh, it's getting harder and harder to find people. Generally, our people are, are trained. We train them internally. Uh, it's not a high-tech job. You know, they need basic ability to understand uh, written instructions, uh, some minor computer computer interface for, you know, logging their production uh, runs. But, uh, um, you know, like just like I said, it's just hard to find people who want to be on the floor working in a production environment in, in, in our area. Yeah, perfect. So 
pay scales vary throughout the country. Uh, what, what do you feel your your average uh, salary would be for one of your or hourly workers? What would that What would that look like? Um, you know, fourteen to fifteen dollars an hour would be the starting uh, it, position. Okay, and to kind of expand on that, there's going to be X amount of executive jobs floor workers and things like that. What do you think the breakdown is on that? It's probably, if we're looking at 50 to 60 people, about 40 to 45 would be production workers. Uh, there would be a handful of technical support, you know, quality control, laboratory personnel, and then, you know, 10 to 12 administrative positions. Okay. We talked about regulatory uh the the regulatory and permitting that you need for this facility in terms of emissions kind yeah. of dive into that a little bit sure sure so we handle uh both aqueous as well as solvent types of coatings in our process uh, so we need the ability to uh get air permits for our incineration where we're burning off the surplus solvents um, so, you know, we're looking for a community that has good access or relationships with the environmental protection agencies uh, in the various areas to help us navigate that approval process. Okay. And what about gas? You talked about, or we've, we've talked about the importance to your overall operation. Uh, I guess, what type of gas uh, usage are you expecting? What type of rates are you looking for? Anything that'll help uh, a community decide if they've got a good advantage for you? Sure, I, I, some rough numbers, and it's a kind of a scale up as as we as the business evolves. Uh, you know, we, we would be trending towards you know 100,000 decatherms of natural gas, and upwards of a million and a half kilowatt hours of uh, of electricity. Um, like I said, on an uninterrupted basis, uh, we run around the clock. Is there any important considerations being a 24 hour, you know, uh, operation that you might need from a community that you're not getting from your community right now? No, just again, availability of labor on those off hours, off shifts is, uh, is hard to find. It's hard to find people who want to work the overnight shift uh, in our area. Um, so if we're, if we're in a better pool, uh, of workforce, uh, you know, it'll be a lot easier to, uh, to tap into that. Okay. So final question here. And then I kind of, you know, I want everybody to know you've been around a while, right? You, it's, you're not just a startup and a company that's looking to do this. You've, you've, you've got uh, some legs in this game, right? Yeah, no, we, we, we were, our business started in 1968 and we've been, uh, we've had several locations that we've consolidated into our current location over the last 20 years. Um, but we're in our 53rd year now and, uh, you know, have been growing steadily. Uh, so, yeah. So with that kind of history, you know, this has got to be a challenge for you, um, in terms of looking at areas, what would you, if you could put your finger and say, this would be the tipping point. I've got two areas that are equal. What, what stands out in your mind that would make you say, Hey, this is a good location over another. Um, you know, I, obviously, I would I would be interested in hearing what potential incentives there are, um, especially as we're growing a workforce from scratch, whether it's training incentives or tax incentives. Um, you know, if we're talking about construction, greenfield construction of a new facility, uh, if there's you know economic development authority money or bonds or you know tax free financing, that would be something that we've uh, would be interested in. We've done that here in our current location. Uh, it was quite successful. Um, yeah, I was going to say, talk to that a little bit um, in terms of your preference, um, you know, speed to market, those types of things in this transition to a, a new operation. Would you be expanding from your current facility and opening an additional facility or would you be looking at relocating? Um, I would be relocating about 75%. We have kind of a couple discrete business units. One's kind of a standalone. That would probably stay here, uh, at least in the short term. Um, 
the rest of it, about 75% of our business would be relocating. So I'd be looking at, like I said earlier, we need to expand into some new equipment and additional investments. I would envision that being installed in the new facility initially, and then over the course of the next year to 18 months, relocate the balance of the, that operation that we're moving. Okay, perfect. Um, and I guess speaking to that tune, um, you've mentioned you'd be open to a build the suit, you know, uh, but is your preference to find an existing facility? Um, not necessarily. I mean, there's, there's obviously advantages to build to suit. Uh, because we can size the building exactly the way we want it. Um, but if I found a, an attractive existing building, we'd be interested in that as well. Like I said, we probably have to make some modifications, minor modifications to the building. Um, but, uh, you know, we're open to either. Okay, great. So that's all the questions here. We have got some questions that have flowed in and uh, we'll start going through those. Um, the first question is from Lee Reeves. She is from Monticello and uh, one of our one of our uh, community clients and we always appreciate them. Uh, they're from Lawrence County Community Development uh, in Mississippi. And so Lee asks, uh, are you willing to locate within an hour to two hour drive on rail trip um, or rail trip from an air, from a port? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, and we kind of talked about that. That really depend, Lee, probably on how those costs, you know, manage into the overall um, operations costs and, and, and whatnot. She also did a follow-up question here. How would you select engineering design firm, an engineering de design firm to assist in the process? In terms of I guess, would construction you, you, of a building? Yeah, I think that's, yeah. Well, you know, depending on the area, we'd probably reach out to local uh, or look for uh, recommendations from from the area that we're moving into. Um, I don't think our building would I would consider highly engineered, so I would think we'd just look to the local lo location to provide that uh, support. Okay. Um, got the next question from Mary Lilly. And Mary is asking, um, is having rail available helpful for moving chemicals? Uh, we don't do that now. Everything's common carrier. Uh, the way we bring materials in and, and ship out. Um, okay. And I don't... Yeah, we're not in the type of bulk where I think, you know, multi rail really lends itself to. Um, uh, but again, I haven't worked that much with rail. We've moved some product across the country, uh, like intermodal and, and rail, but uh, it's not been a big part of our um, our operation. Right. And Mary, Mary's, uh, just so you know, she's one of our communities we work with really close. She's from Greenfield, North Carolina, and she asked another question. Uh, sure. Do you pay a, sh now this is kind of outside of my realm here, a shift differential? Um, we have, and we're starting to again, uh, because we've, we've, we're, we're finding ourselves bouncing people between first and, and second shift. Um, and when we do that, we do pay a differential. Um, but we would pay that if, if that was uh, important to the, you know, or customary to where we're, we're looking at. Typically, okay. it's about a dollar, you know, about a dollar an hour difference if you're working the night shift versus the day shift. Okay. Uh, we've got a question from Donna Phillips. Um, this is kind of just uh, going back to uh, the rail requirement. Um, she's asking, is there a rail requirement, which we've already established is there's not, um, but, um, are you looking, if, if you did do a build a suit or a building, uh, would it be a standalone or could you share a space, uh, for example, in an industrial park? She's with Duke energy in North Carolina. Oh, we could share, we could share space. Um, as long okay. as we had kind of a 
separate section of the area that we can, uh, you know, occupy. We don't want to be broken up. So your emissions don't really affect um, whether or not you share the space. No. Yeah. Any no, I mean we, we don't we don't generate uh, any odors uh, or any smoke. Um, you know, we're just basically incinerating solvents emissions and it's uh it's a pretty clean operation perfect and uh this is from an anonymous attendee uh you don't have a union do you or do, does a union make a difference to you uh no we don't have a union we've uh never had a union um we bought a business with a union and the union after work and working with us uh decertified um so we, we uh, you know, I don't have a lot of experience with unions, but we haven't had one. Okay. Got a question here from Sally. Uh, I mean, Sandy, sorry, Sandy, Sandy Allison. She's from Marshall, Missouri, uh, another uh, community that we work with real close. Um, Want to wanted kind of build off of her question. She's asking again about rent um, or build a suit. But if you did build this suit, um, are you prepared for uh, the extended time that it would uh, take to build that building versus just moving into an existing building? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, we're, we're looking to move on this, but, you know, if we find the right situation to build the suit, you know, an additional six to eight months is not going to, you know, put us off for any reason. I, you know, we, we, we can, our capacity constraints are there, but we can certainly, you know, deal with that additional time needed. Okay. I've got a, another question from North Carolina, uh, Jacob Cooper. Uh, Jacob, that's a great question. Um, on the 60 jobs net new, are they net new or do, are you expecting to try to relocate X amount of your employees from your current facility? Well, that's a great question. So, you know, I would, uh, a few key positions, uh, especially technical positions, I would look to relocate now whether it's on a permanent basis or temporary basis i don't know until we you know uh really work with the group to see who would be willing to do that but um i would say a handful of key positions would probably be relocated and the rest would be would be new okay Donna Phillips uh, asks uh regarding electric a million kilowatts is that annually monthly uh, annually, annually. Uh, probably two know, million. it's probably pushing two million right now okay and do you know your demand load in kilowatts i don't have that in front of me right now yeah we'll be more than glad to grab that and put it within the transcript or whatnot uh we've got we have about, i say we have about two thousand amps coming into our facility now so how okay. Distributed. I, you know, I'm not. I'm not an engineer. I don't claim to be, at least. <laughs> Larkin, he's a great client of ours. Uh, work with him really, really closely. Um, he's asking for a requirement of the depth of an inland port, uh, the depth for an inland port, or just ability to handle multiple containers per month by barge. Is there a requirement? No, we probably bring about 15 containers, 15 to 20 containers in per month. Um, you know, and they're coming into the major seaports of, you know, the New York area. Um, yeah, not, Lar I, yeah, go ahead. I'm not quite sure about, I'm not, not really sure about barges and how that all works. So I, I don't know if I can answer that. Yeah, Larkin's in central Louisiana, so I'm very familiar with the ports. I've toured the area. Very, very good port system. So I think that's expanding on what cities would be able to submit on this if they have an inland port or or if they could, had a transload facility that could work with you. And yep. we, we talked about it yesterday, and it, it really all goes into the numbers. Um, what's the final operational cost and how does yep. um, lower cost of doing business in one area of the business, can it be offset by, by the ports and things like that? Yes. Um, Lee Howard, no, uh, these questions are flying in now.
sorry about that. They just flew up on my screen. Um, we've got Dave Nichols here. Dave, I enjoyed doing the radio show yesterday, so thank you. Um, will it require any permitting from DEQ for your facility? Yes, I mean, we'll, we'll need air permits. Uh, I'm assuming it's similar to what we have at our current location with the state DEP or DEQ uh, to discharge uh, incinerated solvents. Uh, we probably, after treatment of our solvent stream is 15 to 18 tons per year. Okay, perfect. These are, these uh, are, question. Go ahead. These are like volatile organic content materials, like uh, you know, typical solvents you'd use in paint thinning and that sort of thing. Perfect. Uh, I've got a question here from David Fowler. David's one of our newest uh, communities that we've been working with from Fairfield, Texas. Uh, he's asking, in terms of you know the size of the building, which we went over, uh, would you entertain a lease? back or lease buy back um, to own the building and land. Yeah, absolutely. That would definitely be an option. Perfect. Uh, Mary Lily, the again. Key with, the, the, the key with our, our process is, you know, uh, if we're going to lease, it's, it's going to have to be a long-term lease because it's big, heavy, you know, equipment, it's expensive to move. So when we, when we move it or install it, you know, we, we don't really want to go anywhere. So a lease to own option may be a great option for us. Okay, perfect. Mary Lilly asked another question. She's from Greenfield, North Carolina. Um, foreign trade zones, uh, do you take advantage of those now or would they be helpful? They would be helpful, um, especially given the climate of, uh, you know, trade tariffs that are escalated over the last few years. Uh, we, we don't take advantage of it right now, um, but we should. So, yes, it would be helpful. Okay, so that'd be great if the community could help you learn exactly how to take advantage of that also, probably. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Okay, so I got a question here from Gary Wilson. Uh, he's trying to decide if he's a, uh, able to submit on this project. Is 130 miles from a port a deal breaker? No, no it's not. Okay. Not at all. Uh, got a last question right now if anybody else has any other questions go ahead and get them in but i've got a question from charles dick from the economic partnership of north carolina um and uh in your let me read this in your own preliminary research what specific areas are you already looking at or currently see as front runners meaning You've probably been on this process. We came across you in this relationship. We, we're going to enjoy working with you. Have you already started taking a look and formulated some ideas in your mind? Well, we, we started with, a, we put a map together of where our, our customers are located. And and that's what kind of led us to uh, when Brooke sent the, note, uh, the emails out about Choose Texas. I mean, we, Texas is our single largest state where we, where we sell. So... Uh, um, you know, that's kind of drew my attention to that. So, you know, and I, I've done some research on utility costs and they're certainly more favorable in the Texas and, but throughout the South. Uh, so, you know, I was drawn to Texas just because of the, the marketing material that you guys sent out, but, uh, by no means are we honing in only on that. So, uh, like I said, our business is probably 45%, 40% throughout from the Carolinas right around through the, the Gulf into Texas. So, you know, we're kind of open open to that whole area. I wouldn't say there's any one front runner. Yeah, Chris, and you, you hit into a perfect point of the hundreds of companies that we work with. I, I don't even call it a short list anymore. I call it a initial areas of interest. And a lot of times the, the more education you get about different areas, the more interest you have. It's just you don't have enough yeah. education. So that's what I really like about our process is being able to put you in touch with some communities you may have not thought of. And right. um, and we're hoping that they will tailor their submissions to exactly what you need and say, hey, this is why you should take a look at us and get on their short list. Um, okay. I had one other question pop in, actually two now. 
what's your target date? What's your, what's your target date for making a decision on the location and when do you want uh, your machinery flowing and your product flowing? I think we're, you know, we're three to four months from making a firm decision after, you know, assessing different locations. Um, like I said, we're going to be in first installing some new equipment. That's probably about a six month lead time. So uh, if we're looking at an existing building, you know, we're probably looking at, you know, end of the year, beginning of the year to, to start installing. Um, you know, a little bit longer if it's a, a build to suit opportunity, just because it's going to take a little longer. So this is always a good question. Um, and we try to dive into this so that communities don't waste your time and, and, and everybody's making the most use of their time. But Rebecca Nolan, she's from Hartford, Connecticut. We've worked with them for quite a while. Um, she's asking, the, you know, kind of if, if, if the things line up right, would you even take a look at uh, up in the Northeast or uh, Sandy Allison even asked about Missouri? Would you take a look at other opportunities or are those clients and people you're trying to serve too specific that you can't, at, at least on this expansion or relocation? I mean, you know, Connecticut's even getting further from our, from our customer base. So, I mean, it would have to be a, uh, a unique situation there for us to look at. Missouri is centrally located that, you know, we do, we do sell a fair amount on the West coast and in the Pacific Northwest. So from a centralized standpoint, that's, that has some attractiveness. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's what our goal is to, we and the communities want you to be successful in this location so that you do, you do continue to expand. We help some companies yeah. with four or five, uh, plant expansions, and uh, we feel like if you're not successful in this one, you're not gonna <laughs> you're not gonna expand again. So right. it's best to be exactly. best to be honest. Um, uh, so the last question, Gary, we're gonna go straight into Brooke. That's all the questions I have, and uh, thank you for all those questions. Um, Brooke, why don't you talk about the submissions and the submission process, and when we want them in, and and kind of that process. Absolutely. Okay, so um, first things first, uh, I want you guys to answer the quick poll that we're going to throw up. If you're interested in submitting a proposal to Chris um, for evaluation. So um, if you click yes, we'll make sure to reach out to you after the fact and just make sure that you know exactly um, how to upload your submission and get that in by the deadline. Um, our deadline for submissions is going to be March 26th at 5 p.m. Central Standard Time. And um, we'd really appreciate you guys just getting those into the project portal. The, those will be submitted directly into the portal. There's no forms, uh, no additional um, methods that we're utilizing to collect submissions. We ask that those go directly into the portal. Um, and some of you have asked in the past, I um, had submitted a proposal and I hadn't heard anything. Um, do not fret, we see those immediately. We are alerted to every single submission that goes into the portal. So you are taken care of um, once that submission is uploaded. We are gonna be vetting member and non-member submissions. So this is where we take a look at members first and what submissions they are wanting to present to the project. Um, and we make sure that those are sent to the project first for first evaluations and then we open it up to non-member submissions if Chris wants to take a look at other sites um, that have been submitted to us outside of what our members have submitted. Um, and then we've given Chris authority to reach out to communities of interest if he wants to set up some conversations we will gladly assist in that. Um, we do set up one on one calls with communities we've done that with quite a few of our projects and your um, community assessment directors and coaches will be helping you through that um, very quickly as we start that process. And I wanna make sure everyone knows that the uh, recording link and submission instructions always comes from me. And that can be, um, you'll find that in an email from brooke.edwards at gslisolutions.com. Make sure to whitelist that email, make sure to add it to your safe senders list. If you wanna keep receiving emails from us, um, check your spam junk folder. Cause if 
um, you're very interested in our projects and you haven't been seeing emails come across, they might just be in your junk folder. Um, a lot of cities have really difficult um, or stringent firewalls. So we just wanna make sure that you're getting those and getting the information that you want from us. And that's all I have, Eric. Thanks. No problem. So uh, in that process, as I explained, Brooke, here's some contact information for the communities. Real quick, Chris um, had a question late come in about uh, in Mississippi, uh, they have auto manufacturers. Do you work with auto manufacturers in your product sales? We do. We sell, uh, we're probably a tier three supplier to the automotive sector. Uh, so we deal with a lot with subcontractors uh, to that. Perfect. So in terms of our contacts, Brooke, she's more of the coordinator. She'll be filtering through this information. We do have what we call community assessment directors and coaches that help the communities uh, organize and format their submissions in proper format so that it's useful to the companies. Uh, Amanda Tompkins is one of our season vets and Carol Harris is another one of our season vets that once your submission comes in, you may be reach, uh, having a call from them walking you through the process, getting your submission in, making sure it's clean, exactly what the client's looking for um, so that it, it gets the necessary attention. Um, that's it for today, guys. And I want to, Chris, I want to thank you for the amount of time that you've, that you've spent uh, with us, educating us about the project and, and what you've done uh, so far with your business, it's exciting to see uh, and be able to help participate in your success of an expansion. And we hope that that process is smooth with our group. And um, I want to thank the communities and companies that have joined us today. Um, I know it's um, you're very busy running your cities and helping your businesses grow within the cities. And uh, but we want to open your eyes to these projects uh, because we're all about job creation. And the more jobs we can create uh, in the United States, uh, the more success the communities have in their growth. So thank you for taking your time today uh, and listening to this. Uh, so until we have our next prospect live, look for your emails. We'll be announcing that soon. Um, thank you for attending and goodbye. Thank you very much.